uh, we're going to be talking about pack force librarians and recipes. So thank you for joining us today uh, for a bite of history. This program will be structured a bit differently from previous bites of history. So in the past, I've broken the program into three different segments where I presented a lecture, a uh, video demonstration, and finally a Q&A. This time we'll be given a bit more up and close and personal with the dishes. I still have the videos included, but I would also like to provide a couple of additional demonstrations too while we're at it. Uh, today we have three different dishes or subjects that we're going to be examining instead of a single dish. And we'll talk a little bit about the Pack Horse Librarians, then the origins of the dish, and discuss the historical significance of the different methods of preserving food that's featured within this program. So between 1936 to 1940, uh, Kentucky's Pack Horse Librarians were responsible for bringing and sharing culture within the Appalachian region to those who didn't have access to these resources otherwise. Among the passed around materials were old scrapbooks containing family recipes, quilting patterns, nature pictures, uh, crafts. Today, only a handful of these scrapbooks are still in existence. And I have the pleasure of bringing three recipes directly to you. I will demonstrate how to prepare those dishes and provide possible contemporary updates to the recipes. Uh, some modern twists, if you will. So the Pack Horse Librarian Project was part of the New Deal Initiative and implemented by the Work Programs Administration. They delivered to over 10,000 square miles of eastern Kentucky. Uh, Kentucky was already having a difficult time keeping up with infrastructure norms. The Depression exacerbated these issues, and in 1930, it was known that approximately 31% of the population couldn't read. In 1934, the first WPA-sponsored library was established in Leslie County. Carriers were required to ride out at least twice a month and they would cover about 100 to 120 miles a week. And you can discover a wealth of information regarding what a region has access to by studying these scrapbook recipes. You begin to glean what was and was not available to the populace. Also, you begin to notice a tapestry of facts that would only present themselves in this time period. You learn what was considered important and sacred in regards to how we ate. And not all of these recipes were completely original though. Sometimes contributors borrowed some of the recipes from magazines and other resources. However, it still helped paint that picture of availability, what they had access to. So the first recipe or the first dish is one that struck me as odd while browsing through these documents. And I'm, I'm one for anything that, you know, just culinarily stops me in my tracks. And I'm also a huge fan of pickled foods. So this one really hit all the markers for me. Hopefully the dish's namesake doesn't immediately scare you off, but I assure you that the dish, when applied correctly, can be full of flavor and character. So pickled chicken. Pickling has been a part of our diets for at least 4,000 years. Acidic brine has been the go-to preservation method in a pre-fridge world, and it makes perfect sense. Historians like to place the origins back to about 2400 BC, where Mesopotamians had to fight with quickly degrading foodstuffs. Brine was a way to make sure that long-term storage of food would be possible. So what exactly is pickling? From a scientific standpoint, pickling is a process of introducing anaerobic fermentation by either using brine or immersing in vinegar. In pickling, the solution passes through the meat using the process of osmosis. Essentially, when you place a meat into a pickling solution, the salt and the water content inside the meat tries to equalize with the salt and water that's outside resulting in more salt and water 
within the meat than there was previously. This explains why pickling tends to result in meat that retains large amounts of juice and seems to keep moisture better than other preparation methods. One guess that the reason that you had Appalachian full pickling chicken was the desire to keep food stable and edible over long periods of time. This is still considered depression era cooking. So stretching your dollar as far as it could go was just common sense. You needed to use the whole chicken and pickling would add flavor to parts that would generally be lacking in that department. Also, if we're gonna be discussing brining practices, we should also talk about salt. So salt is the go-to preservation for practically all of society. Salt played a pivotal role in guiding society away from the hunter-gatherer way of life. And most prepared foods require salt to stave off bacteria and keep food fresh longer. But also salt allowed people to stockpile food without worrying meal to meal. The relationship between humans and salt, it's an ancient one. Our ancestors learned salt locations by following animals that would lead people to salt licks or brine springs. The relationship swung both ways though. For example, uh, reindeer would be known to gather where humans would urinate to gain access to sodium content in urine. In fact, early people used this knowledge to tame, not, not necessarily domesticate, but tame reindeer. Our ancestors would pick a spot outside of a village and that would be like the designated grounds specifically to attract reindeer. So as I said before, I, I had reservations about this recipe all the way up to preparing it. It's difficult to deny the fact that science makes sense though. Survivors of depression era cooking always found ways to make food stretch as far as possible. This is relevant, especially today with current hardships uh, that a huge portion of us are experiencing just trying to get by today. I provided two versions of the recipe. Uh, one version is just a pickled chicken recipe from the original scrapbooks, which it's displaying now on the screen. Uh, this will be the version that's demonstrated in the video. The second version we'll discuss after the video. And one more note, in the scrapbook, the recipe has you using the whole chicken and we're going to be using chicken tenders instead. Uh, this was done kind of as a convenience modification. In the original recipe though, they suggest using four chickens and to boil them till tender enough for meat to fall from the bones. Place in a stone jar and pour over three pints of cold good cider vinegar and a pint and a half of water in which chickens were boiled. Uh, you can add spices if preferred, and it would be ready in two days. Now, three pints is about six cups. So six cups of uh, your vinegar and then about three cups, two to three cups of your water. Bring a pot of water to boil. Once boiling, add your chicken. So you're looking for this color and consistency within the chicken. Uh, you're trying to get it near done, but not overcooked. That looks, uh, looks pretty good.
We're going to pour in six cups of apple cider vinegar. And next we're going to add about three to four cups of water that we boiled our chicken in. Finally, add the boiled chicken to the jar. We're going to store this for about two days or 48 hours. Okay, so, well, uh, what we ended up with is right here. I'll take these out so you can see them. And I used two different methods of brining. I used apple cider with one of them. And just on like happenstance, I decided to use white vinegar for the other. Um, this is how the apple cider one came out. Uh, a lot of color transference from the vinegar. So, and uh, smell, definitely smells much more like pickled, pickled, uh, whatever. <laughs> like uh, that, that basic pickling smell that, that. But this, this was the white vinegar that I used. And surprisingly, smells much more like chicken. Uh, doesn't have as strong of a like vinegar flavor to it. And honestly, I, I ate this stuff uh, without adding it to anything, using it for anything else. And it was like eating chicken with sweet and sour sauce. Like legit, that's what it tastes like. So if we're going to make modifications, to the brine, this is how we would do it. So I have a collection of spices here. And essentially what I'm doing is that I am going to be adding some cayenne pepper. Where is it at? That's chili. Some cayenne pepper, some garlic powder, some chili powder, and some paprika. Now, this is kind of like a Nashville-inspired twist on pickled chicken. It's going to give it a bit more heat. We're also going to be using some dark brown sugar. I have light brown sugar here. Um, I must have grabbed the wrong one. But anyways, uh, same idea. You're going to use dark instead of light. And it's going to add a little bit of sweet and a little bit of heat to it. And it's going to level out that, that vinegar, that pickling flavor. And an, an additional serving suggestion would be to shred, then add the chicken to possibly like a seven bean salad. You know, it's the flavor profile is going to match up nicely. It's going to mix together with, with, those, other, uh, with those other flavors without any issues. So, on to next. Okay. Bear with me for just a moment. There we go. So we went over the, uh, the additions if we were to make an alternative. So our next recipe 
is a blackberry jam. And blackberries are generally lumped together with other small fruits referred to as brambles or cane berries. And they're considered Kentucky's state fruit, actually. Uh, blackberries usually don't bear fruit the first season. Uh, these blackberries are referred to as primocanes. Uh, once fruit bearing, they're known as floricanes. After, they're, after they bear their fruit and they're harvested, these floricanes will die. However, there's an exception known as a primocane fruiting blackberry. At the beginning of the 16th century, little chests of marmalada, which is, as you can probably guess from the sound of it, it's marmalade, Portuguese quince fruit preserves were used and included in cargoes of Portuguese merchant ships arriving in English ports. The English reverse engineered the marmalada and started using the same process on pears, damsons, or plums. This introduced marmalade. By the 17th century, some marmalades were made into looser textures and they were potted instead of box. And in these case, or in the case of softer fruits like gooseberries, mulberries, raspberries, and cherries, these preserves began to be known in England as jam. So our recipe says to mash berries thoroughly then cook until tender, adding small amounts of water as possible to start cooking. Strain juice from pulp, then add one half juice and one half sugar. Boil until it will thicken when poured on a cold saucer and pour into jelly jars. It is not necessary to seal, just cover. So the actual preparation of jam, it's, it is simple. However, if you've never done it before, it can be a little complex. You're trying to mix equal parts of your juice and your sugar in a pot to boil, and the trick is timing. If you let your jam boil too long, it becomes over thickened, almost like honey. It still tastes good, but you're going to really tear your wrists out trying to spread it out on whatever. The reason for this is called the pectin. And pectin activates when you boil fruit juices, it starts to build a network that is now telling the jam to thicken instead of becoming looser. A general rule of thumb is if you pour a little of your jam, as I said before, on a cold saucer and then you press it with your finger, if the jam doesn't flood back immediately into place, then your jam is starting to form that pectin network correctly. And we're gonna show how to prepare a blackberry jam from the recipe that they provided. And then I will show you uh, a modification that you can make on that. Start by crushing your blackberries on a low heat. Our objective here is to separate the seeds from the fruit, and we're going to accomplish that by using a masher and spoon. This can take a while since you really have to crush everything down as much as possible.
While crushing and stirring, add small amounts of water to help loosen the fruit. That should do it. I use a wire mesh strainer to separate the seeds. You can use a strainer along with a spoon and masher to get the job done. You're going to measure out your juice, which you're going to record. From here, you're going to measure out an equal amount of sugar. Return the mixture to boil. To test, pour samples of the jam on a cold saucer. Press your pinky into the jam. If it immediately floods back, keep cooking. Once it shows signs of wrinkling, quickly remove from heat and pour into a container.
So this is how that came out. And as you can see, there's about half a jar left. So yeah, it was pretty good. <laughs> so uh, talking about the different ways that you can modify this, there's a few additional uh, ingredients that you could add. One of the ingredients that I thought about that would be paired perfectly with us with the blackberries is caramelized onion. Now, when you're cutting your onions to make caramelized onion, you're going to start from the root here. You're gonna make a slice in to remove that root end, throw it aside. And then what you can do is you can either cut it in half now, or you can peel back the, uh, the skin now, cut it in half after. It'll probably be cleaner peeling it back now, but essentially what you're gonna do is you're gonna peel back that top layer all the way back. from the rest of the onion. So we got to uh, kind of get a handle on it here towards the, uh, the other side. And then once we got that, let's do one cut, throw that aside, don't need any more. Then we can take our knife, that in half. And now what we're gonna do to cut it uh, with caramelized onions, what you really wanna do is have your slices be a bit thicker. You don't want thin slices because as caramelized onions cooking down, it loses some of the, uh, I'd say durability from it. So the pieces kind of shrink down a little bit, they get smaller and they get looser. And if you just have a bunch of really thin sliced onion, all you're going to get is like a mash towards the end of it. You're not, your onion isn't going to stay together. It's not gonna retain its shape. So for this, just do some thicker size slices there. So about yay, yay thick. And that's what you're gonna use for your caramelized, uh, caramelized onions. And with the onions, you're going to add butter and olive oil to your pan, salt and sugar to taste. The sugar is not required. There's enough natural sugar within like sweet Vidalia onions, uh, Spanish onions that you really don't need to add extra. But if you're one of those people that do, that's fine. Um, it's to taste. So you're gonna to want to set this to medium, medium low, depending on your soaps burner. And you don't want the onions to dry out during the process. So max cooking time is we'd say about 45 minutes. Uh, any more than that, and you're not going to get what you want. And when I was doing the research in regards to like the, uh, the blackberry, the jam and whatnot, I came across this uh, book. It's Pickled, Potted, and Canned by Sue Shepard. It's, uh, it's pretty neat. Uh, it has some pretty interesting origin stories about uh, the canning process. Um, people within, I think there was one story about cans of honey and during uh, around Mesopotamia and how they discovered how they were preserving all these different things in honey, the Egyptians were. And um, I'm not going to spoil anything because one of the first stories that they go through, it's uh, it's uh, shocking to say the least. But uh, let's see here. Let's go to the next one. I'm gonna bear with me for just a moment here. Also, if you wanted to, um, take a bits. Yeah, you throw these in there too with them. Uh, you'll get a little more extra protein out of the jam. It's, I think it's fine. Well, once again, you know, that could be a personal preference. Okay. 
Okay. So next we have potato cakes. And potato cakes have a storied history, you know, reaching back to Europe and Russia, this potato dish is uh, favored amongst many different cultural groups and sometimes referred to as like lockies in Russia and Poland or boxty in Ireland. Uh, lockies were differed due to the inclusion of matzo, uh, milk and baking powder, uh, whereas the recipe I'm going to provide you today is much more bare bones than that. Um, it's literally potato, mashed potatoes, uh, flour, egg. It's, it's much more simple. But in comparison, the boxies tend to be much more dense than lockies are. So potatoes were originally from Peru before the Colombian exchange introduced the European world to them, uh, usually associated with the poor. Potatoes actually started as a luxury food. Still, once peasants and farmers learned how easy it was for them to grow them in European regions, the rich abandoned potatoes in the fear of the food being associated with them. Which is, I don't know, it's kind of funny. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Potatoes were Appalachian's rice. Since rice had difficulties growing in the mountainous regions, potatoes were much easier to care for. Uh, they're generally referred to as arsh potatoes which means that they're Irish or white potato. And the word arsh is used to differentiate between regular potatoes and sweet potatoes. So potato cakes, as the recipe describes, it says to take cold mashed potatoes, beat two eggs well, mix with the potatoes in a small amount of flour, roll into cakes and fry brown in heated hot fat. The recipe that I provide has a bit more, um, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, exact like measurements than what they're saying, just to add a little bit of flour, because that's a lot of recipes during this time, that's kind of how they wrote them down. They, a lot of them didn't really have like, use two third cups or use three tablespoons. Then it's like, use a dash or, you know, take a handful, throw it in there. Yeah, you know, and uh, it's a lot of recipes were kind of formulated like that. So I went through the trouble of figuring out some ratios and I found out that the ratios that I included um, actually end up making a pretty decent dense uh, potato cake. So the next video is a demonstration on how to prepare your potato cakes at home. Uh, for the mashed potato base, I used a mixture of butter, salt, and uh, not sour cream, uh, cream cheese. I have the recipe for the mashed potatoes as well as I prepared them here uh, in that recipe document that I included. Start by measuring out four cups of cold mashed potatoes. At that point, I was tired of mixing all the ingredients <laughs> together. And small amounts of. Food. 
flour if needed. You can use vegetable oil if you prefer, however, for authenticity, I'm going to be using the towel of the cookies. Personally, I prefer using pure fat anyways for frying. There are very few things that don't benefit from frying in tallow. We're going to be cooking these on each side for four to five minutes. First, there were five. And now there are four. Yeah, I ate one. <laughs> so, uh, let's see here. So, to kick these up a notch, uh, we're going to be using some green onion tops. Uh, just basic green onion, uh, bacon bits, and you can either use shredded cheddar. However, I decided to go a different direction and use shredded mozzarella instead. And what I did is I added all three of those into my batter, my mix of the potatoes. Uh, before I rolled them out into patties. And then with the mozzarella, when I place the cake in there after it's been everything's been mixed into the pan, I put like a small little amount of shredded cheese on top of it. Uh, once it flipped, you know, I flipped it, keeping the cheese on there, creating kind of a crisp on the outside. And then I did the other side afterwards after I had flipped it. And it's, uh, it's really good. <laughs> to say the least. Um, well, you know, it's, it's probably not the best food if you're looking to avoid, you know, carbs, but 
And it still tastes good. <laughs> so with uh, those three recipes that I had prepared for you today, I, I hope you enjoyed the program. And uh, shortly we'll be taking questions. Uh, don't forget to check our calendar for upcoming events and definitely check out the virtual author visit uh, with the Book Women of Troublesome Creek's author, Kim Michelle Richardson on April 8th. Uh, registration for that program will be starting tomorrow.